Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky will be watching our new PM closely, having enjoyed a close relationship with uh, former PM Boris Johnson. Well, there's speculation that Rishi Sunak may abandon the defence spending pledge of 3% of GDP. Let's find out more. The Telegraph's Defence and Foreign Affairs editor, Con Coughlin, joins us now. Very good morning to you. Uh, Boris good Johnson morning. was very much on the front foot in terms of his relationship with Zelensky and his... Uh, profound support of Ukraine. Is Rishi Sunak going to follow suit in the same way and can he afford to? Well, firstly, uh, Rishi Sunak has spoken to President Zelensky. It was one of the first things he did after he became prime minister yesterday and he's pledged support. But I, I fear that just like Boris Johnson, he's going to talk the talk. But when it comes to giving defence the extra funds it needs to be a proper deterrent force in terms of the the overall Russian threat, I think he's going to back away from that. Uh, Boris Johnson uh, did not uh, commit to more money for, for defence in any meaningful way. Uh, it was other people in the, in the Johnson cabinet that were calling for the 3% um, level of defence spending. Um, Rishi Sunak has never really committed himself to that kind of level, which would see some pretty significant increases in defence spending over the next decade and would get us uh, properly fighting fit to deal with the Russian threat and other threats, such as China. So, But there will be other people in the cabinet. I think James Cleverley, um, Ben Wallace, who's been retained as Defence Secretary, and even uh, Jeremy Hunt, who, when he was Foreign Secretary back in the day, was calling for a significant uplift in defence spending. It would be very interesting to see how this plays out. I think we have the making of the first major cabinet row within the first day of, of the Rishi Sunak government. You understand the argument, though, that there's a 40 billion black hole in the, in the country's finances, and that there is an argument that we've put so much money into Ukraine, this is, seems to be a never-ending war, and as important as that is, that money could be used to build more hospitals. Well, people will make those, those arguments, but this is, this is a f far more fundamental issue about freedom and democracy. And if we allow... Uh, tyrants, despots like Vladimir Putin to go around Europe annexing ter territory and killing people, then our whole way of life is under threat. And it's not just from rising gas prices. So it is a balance. But the, the amount of money we've, we've given to Ukraine uh, in the course of this conflict since February is relatively modest compared with the overall budget. It's, it's in, in the low billions, if, if that. Um, so you know, it's a question of balancing. Uh, the books. We, we spend money, you know, do we need to have HR, H HGS2, um, for example, which seems to be the most enormous drain on the public purse? That There are a whole range of issues you can look at. But I, I personally think that, you know, we've got to man up, so to speak, um, in terms of our defensive capabilities. Uh, we've now got the smallest army since before the Napoleonic Wars, and we're cutting the army still further in terms of its size at a time when we've got a major war going on in the soil of Europe. It's ludicrous, and it shouldn't be allowed to persist.